Osteobites is a weekly osteosarcoma webinar and podcast presented by MIB agents. Today we are talking with Dr. Brian Flesner on adjuvant chemotherapy for canine osteosarcoma patients. Our panelists are Charlotte Murdoff, OsteoWare, Casey Crossan, MIB Agents Development and Operations Chief, and I'm your host, Anne Graham, President of MIB Agents. Welcome to Osteobites, everybody. The bite of the day at OsteoWare's headquarters or Osteosarcoma MIB Agents headquarters is veggie straws, which are totally acceptable because they do not resemble or taste like vegetables at all. So it makes me happy. I hope you have your snack ready too for Osteobites. Today we're excited to speak with Dr. Brian Flesner. He's the Assistant Professor of Oncology, College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Missouri. He has a strong interest and body of work in canine osteosarcoma. Our panelists today are OsteoWarrior Charlotte Murdoff and our MIV Agents team member, Casey Crossan, and I'm your host, Ann Graham also an Osteo Warrior and president of MIB Agents. A lot to tell you about MIB Agents today. <laughs> MIB Agents makes it better MIB for kids with osteosarcoma. We help kids and families facing this aggressive cancer by providing patient and family support, educational programs for physicians and families, and by funding osteosarcoma specific research. Our patient programs include this is where I, sorry, just got to hang on with me for a second here. We have ambassador agents where we have trained osteosarcoma survivors and caregivers who visit osteowarriors in treatment. We have agent writers. They write letters of hope and support for those who are in treatment. We have agent totes, which are filled totes with goodies and necessities for kids and caregivers in treatment. We do end of life missions for kids who have entered into hospice care. We offer them an experience or, or item of comfort and an entertainment. We have a healing hearts program, which Casey is in charge of. This is for bereaved osteo angel parents. We have a gamer agent program where we have trained ambassador agents who game with fellow osteo warriors prayer agents who join whatever their spiritual practice in uh, prayer or um, good energy or what have you for urgent or ongoing prayer needs for our osteosarcoma families. And we have informational items and experiences, including the osteosarcoma book, uh, which is being translated into Spanish right now and is currently available in Chinese as well. Of course, we also have Osteobites, the Factor Osteosarcoma Conference, and our testing and research directory. We're able to provide this meaningful, ongoing support with and these resources because of you. We're halfway through our Childhood Cancer Awareness Month campaign, and we are halfway to our goal to $40,000 to support all of these programs and missions for throughout the year. If you're able to help, please do. In the meantime, Speaking of making it better, Dr. Flesner, would you get us started by introducing yourself, please? Yeah, um, hi, I'm uh, Brian Flesner. I uh, am an assistant professor at the University of Missouri uh, College of Vet Med. I've been here uh, this December five years uh, after training in some other places. Uh, I won't spoil that slide. I, I like maps, so I'll show a quick map of, of my trajectory where I've been. Um, but yeah, that's me. Hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm a junior in high school and I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma in July 2018. I relapsed the next year in December and February and I started a different chemotherapy treatment in March 2020 and I just recently finished in July. Yay! Yay! Yay. Awesome! <laughs> I am Casey Crossan. Um, my son Connor had osteosarcoma and I am a volunteer um, for MIB agents and just thrilled to be here today. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about adjuvant immunotherapy for our canine osteosarcoma. Um, definitely correlates for the, the human uh, disease as well, human counterparts. Um, so I, I think uh, when I, I actually spoke at, and we were having a little joke about this um, before the, the webinar started, um, I spoke uh, at the Factor Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona, and, and I told everybody there, which I think is now um, uh, a legend, I guess, that 
Um, I, I initially thought not that MIV was spam, um, but that the, uh, the uh, medical doctor that invited me to speak was spam. <laughs> so I'm sure I'll get ribbed about that for a long time. But um, the big thing that, that I want to focus on is that canine osteosarcoma is very, very similar to its human counterpart of um, human osteosarcoma. Um, and we'll talk about some immunotherapy approaches that we've uh, performed here at the University of Missouri. Um, the first one, uh, we were the sole site uh, for um, academic wise, I guess, for the Elias immunotherapy trial. And I think a couple people from Elias are on the call today, which is awesome. Um, the other trials that the, um, in the last four to five years that we've uh, been participated in are run by the National Cancer Institute uh, and the um, organization there is the Comparative Oncology Trials Consortium. And so I'll just uh, use the acronym COTC for those. Uh, 021 and 022 were the first two osteosarcoma uh, multi-institutional studies uh, that we performed uh, nationwide and we were part of those. So I'll give you a little brief uh, um, review of those. Uh, Amy LeBlanc is the director of the NCI COTC and she also spoke at the Factor Conference uh, back in February. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit about COTC26, that's the Listeria vaccine um, that we're still following dogs on uh, for canine osteosarcoma. And then I'll talk about a couple other endeavors we're doing that aren't necessarily um, immunotherapeutics, but looking at the immune system and its role uh, in osteosarcoma, and then some future directions. I think that'll be what most people are interested in, um, where this could translate to, uh, to people. So a brief uh, where I'm from. Again, I said I, I like maps, so I'm originally from Western Illinois. Um, so most of this is going to be flyover states, but I'm from a farm in Western Illinois. Um, I went to undergrad at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, and then went to vet school at the University of Illinois. And I have a lot of people ask me, so you're a veterinarian, why do you just do cancer? Well, for us, uh, it's very similar to, to medical doctors. We also do advanced training if we're going to specialize. So I did an internship actually in San Diego, California, which was an eye-opener for me being from a farm in, in Illinois. Um, and then I got a residency at the University of Missouri uh, back in 2011. Uh, after finishing that, I actually took a faculty position at LSU uh, in Louisiana. And then um, about, like I said, five years ago, I came back to the University of Missouri. Um, so I've been here um, for quite a while. Um, so that's my little a path around the country. I, I haven't gone east, so I don't know if that's ever going to be uh, what's next, but um, mainly Midwest, uh, but kind of some ventures as well. And then I also like to show people that um, I, I'm from pretty normal folks as well. My family has a, a row crop and cattle farm in western Illinois. Um, I don't know if anybody can see up in this corner. That's me driving the John Deere uh, tractor with a hay rake. Um, we have limousine cattle, and then we also farm corn and soybeans. So uh, I was supposed to be a cow vet, uh, actually, when I started vet school, and then I got, um, I always say sidetracked uh, by osteosarcoma, but really um, cancer uh, in general. So the, the big thing I wanted to focus on for the disease process is that these are images of dogs. Um, and so we, also, we often say, you know, um, before human trials or human research endeavors, usually we use animal models, and the most common animal models are usually immunocompromised mice and rats. The nice thing about the canine model is that this is a spontaneous disease just like in people and it has many of the same features. So um, the, the left image here is actually a dog with uh, distal radius osteosarcoma, which is also a common site in people. We see it in the proximal humerus and distal radius most commonly um, as, in, as in people. So I think you can see this aggressive bone lesion here in this dog's um, distal, distal radius. Um, we focus on surgery and chemotherapy, mainstays uh, in human osteosarcoma as well. And the biggest um, uh, problem that we run into down the road is pulmonary metastases. And I think that's very similar to people as well. There could be bone mets, soft tissue mets, but really it's uh, pulmonary metastases uh, or lung metastases. So I just showed, this is actually one of my um, clinical trials dogs that had a kind of a weird presentation of um, oligometastasis or, or solitary instead of diffuse metastases. So um, this pet was actually on um, an immunotherapy trial. Did have metastasis, but a quite different presentation than we're used to seeing um, of a more diffuse metastatic pattern. So um, the disease uh, does look uh, a lot like the human counterpart. Um, there's been a lot of papers that talk about the correlation between dogs and people. Um, and this uh, table is just to show you that um, they're, they're really similar. 
I think a lot of people say, well, you know, when dogs get osteosarcoma, um, they're a little older in life. And I think if you think about dog years, yes, but natural um, time frame, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the mean ages are, are pretty similar. And again, we talk about dog years versus human years, but um, cancer, I don't know, follows those, uh, those time frames as well. Um, we've actually found a pretty um, uh, uh, repeatable finding of uh, the taller dogs are. So people will talk about weight, being involved in, really this is a large breed uh, tumor uh, in dogs, um, but the taller they are, the, the more likely they are to get it. And so our poster children are, are giant dogs like Irish Wolfhounds, Rottweilers, um, uh, Labs and Goldens. Um, I did, I did mention the metaphyseal locations, distal radius and proximal humerus. And again, in people, that's a very similar finding as well. Um, we don't necessarily know exactly why these things happen. Um, there's a lot of people looking at genetic alterations. People have talked about how fast you grow, um, open growth place, those things. But I don't think we know exactly the cause of this. Um, the, the DNA itself in these tumors is, is pretty mutated, and you'll hear that repeatedly that, yes, P53 mutations are the most widespread and common mutation, but a lot of the mutations are all over the board. Um, almost every one of these tumors is high grade, and so in dogs, we think that almost 100% are a, a high grade and very likely to spread, and in people also, um, you know, very, very uh, high grade, majority of those. And I did mention as well that the metastatic sites, um, this cancer does uh, prefer to go to lung over bone and other soft tissues. So this table is really just to show that the, the disease is quite similar between species. Um, and I thought about throwing this in there, but I ran out of time. Um, there is actually a, a case report. It's kind of funny to say case report, um, but earlier this summer, a dinosaur with osteosarcoma was found uh, in Southern Alberta, uh, which I love dinosaurs growing up. Um, and I, I'm, maybe my mom will hear this at some point, but um, I sent her and my grandma the, the article and I said, look, I, you know, I could study dinosaurs with cancer too, which is kind of crazy, but this isn't just um, unique to humans. It's, it's, you know, across all kinds of species. And it's pretty crazy that even um, scientists have found it in, uh, this disease in dinosaurs. So um, I do want to focus a little bit on uh, immunotherapy approaches and historical ones. Um, I'll, I'll go through this and then and I'll see if anybody has questions, but there's really not a ton of uh, literature on immunotherapy uh, in osteosarcoma. The first signal for the use of immunotherapy was in dogs that have limb spare procedures at Colorado State, and dogs with infections were found to live a lot longer than dogs without infections, uh, and so that kind of stimulated minds to look at why, and you know the big thing was immune activation but those dogs with limb spares had their tumors removed. So um, I guess scientists weren't exactly sure at first of what that infection led to, but after that, multiple uh, uh, studies have found that yes, this probably is an immunogenic tumor and we could uh, get the immune system partic to participate uh, in fighting the disease. So the closest thing that, that um, I can find to what we did in the Elias clinical trial is um, there was a xenogenetic, which means different species, um, tall 104. So xenogenic meaning um, this is for dogs. So actually this is a human uh, T-cell line. So dogs actually received kind of um, immortalized, uh, hungry, if you will, killer T-cells to go after the dog's osteosarcoma. Most of the studies that have been done did use dogs that had already had amputation and chemotherapy, and then the immunotherapy approaches were used. And this um, study did as well. They dogs had amputation, adjuvant cisplatin, and then if still free of metastasis, they then receive this um, xenogenetic uh, infusion. Um, it didn't really um, promote dogs or, or, or push dogs to have longer survival than chemo alone, and so people have tried other things, and one of those is actually kind of a, a nonspecific immune stimulant, uh, LMTPPE. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but um, it's actually just kind of uh, pieces of cell walls um, of different uh, infectious agents. And so there was a study, this is now um, a bit old, but dogs that received the uh, immune agent LMTPPE um, had a significantly increased survival time to dogs that got the empty liposome, which encased that infectious or that immune agent um, to the liposome alone. And that was pretty significant p-value there. Um, and so this was probably the best um, study long uh, historically because these dogs didn't have chemotherapy. They just had this 
new agents. Um, currently, people have asked me about this. I think LMTPPE is really hard to find and you may be able to find it in Europe, uh, but I don't know that it's available here in the States. I don't know if anybody's manufacturing it. There are also plenty of studies that have looked at vaccines, whether those be autologous, um, allogeneic, um, there's talk about monoclonal antibodies, excuse me. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the HER2 listeria vaccine. Um, but again, most of these studies have looked at dogs after they've already had amputation and adjuvant chemotherapy. So that's kind of the historic, uh, really quick summary of, of immune approaches for osteosarcoma in dogs. Um, and do you have any questions for me right now before I move on to specific trials? As it, with humans on immunotherapy trials, a fever is a good thing, yes? Yeah. yeah. Is it the same, so same thing in dogs? So yeah, we wanna see evidence that the immune system is activated. Um, if you look at numbers wise, enough numbers to show fever versus not, um, I can't tell you that the numbers are big enough in our canine studies to show dogs that get a fever do better than dogs that don't. Um, anecdotally, I can tell you in the studies we've done, the dogs that feel sick during their immune uh, therapies have done better, but I don't have numbers to say it's this many months more, it's this many years more, but yes, you're right. If, if we wanna see um, the target uh, working, and so again, the target's your immune system, to activate it would most likely mean a fever. Yeah, so good question. I just don't have enough numbers to tell you that. Yeah. What kind of infections are you seeing in your canine patients that are that are showing up and, and making them somehow less susceptible to metastatic disease? Yeah, so those those um, historical reports with limb spares where they had some mm -hmm. sort of implant and that could be metallic, it could be um, allogeneic, um, even autologous. They've done some different things. Most of those were normal flora, either from the skin or from the surgical procedure itself and that implant being a nidus for infection. Um, the most common bone infections in dogs are usually the gram positives like staph or streps. Um, so uh, I'd have to go back and look at the original limb spares to see if it really was staph and streps, but most commonly what I deal with um, are gram positives that probably are, are from skin and were transferred during the limb spare procedure and, and, and uh, took up um, shop, if you will, on the implants. So, but it's, it's kind of weird. It's not a nice thing to think, but like the dogs that get infections, we're almost kind of like, oh, we can manage this infection. You know, hopefully they'll, they'll live longer. Um, and so uh, I, I don't, I don't know that that's the good thing. We don't want them to get an infection. Um, but that's a, that's an interesting um, side effect, if you will. So. Yeah, good question. Okay, so I have a math question for you, which is not a oh, gosh. because math is not my jam. <laughs> fear not, it's going to be an easy one if it's coming from me. So uh, on your on your chart or on the last slide, you were saying a seven year old dog, fourteen year old human. So when I think of a seven year old dog, I think of seven times seven being forty nine. Yeah, is that right? Because I the reason I'm asking this question is. Another, we were speaking with another researcher who said that's actually not how it works, where you just multiply the dog's age by seven. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, so you have to think about, we have Chihuahuas all the way to Great Pyrenees. And so the other example I'll give you, Great Dane's lifespan is expected to be six to eight years. A Chihuahua's lifespan could be 15 years. So that whole times by seven isn't really fair for the wide spectrum of breeds that we have. Um, there's been some more aging studies in dogs. What I will say is that while the dog's life expectancy is different than humans, not necessarily all of their physiologic processes are that sped up. Um, so if you look at, let's say, gestation or maturity or those things, it's not really that one-seventh of time. Mm -hmm. um, so most dogs will reach sexual maturity by, um, you know, over six months, probably over one year. Um, that's different than humans, right? That could be sexually mature from anywhere of 12 to 18. So um, that's not one seventh. So I, I think that we give that as life expectancy, but the physiologic processes and aging processes are not that simple. I don't know if I answered that very yep. well. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So the, the first thing I'm going to chat about is um, what I spoke uh, with, uh, with the group in Scottsdale about is our um, Elias clinical trial where we actually looked at um, autologous cancer vaccines 
So the dog's own cancer cells were, were made into a vaccine. We then actually collected uh, immune cells, and hopefully those were a bit activated from the vaccine, um, stimulated those ex vivo outside of the body and then gave them back. So that's the adoptive T cell transfer. Um, and followed that with um, what we call a cytokine boost. Um, interleukin-2 is one of the most potent immunostimulatory molecules or cytokines. Uh, and so these dogs also then got interleukin-2. So kind of like a, a trifecta, if you will, of different immune approaches. Um, so not just one immune approach, multiple, all in one. Um, and so this paper just got um, accepted and kind of Ann and I um, talked a bit about um, this, and I think that led to a bit more of the, the osteobites workshop, but we we're pretty, pretty proud of this work, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I like this schematic. Um, Elias, the, this is their uh, visual, so I, I steal it, um, but I have permission <laughs> to steal this. So the big thing is that dogs um, would have their uh, initial staging and then plan for a surgery. The, the big issue with this is at surgery, you have to collect a uh, tumor sample, and that tumor sample has to stay viable so that you can grow a vaccine. And so that's, I guess, with all the different immune approaches and specifically vaccines, um, there's got to be a lot of care in making that vaccine and keeping those cells happy because if they die, you know, the vaccine is, is moot. Um, so these are live cell vaccines. So um, we actually, um, I don't want to knock on wood, but, but did really well with, um, with our, I hope, prep. And then uh, Elias did a great job with vaccine growth. Um, so the dogs received um, a plan, three vaccines. And again, this is their own tumor that was taken out of their body a vaccine was produced and then given back to the dogs. People may say, well, why wouldn't, why wouldn't they already have kind of seen their tumor? But that's the whole game here is that your immune system should clear anything that's abnormal. So your immune system should have already said, hey, that cancer isn't normal. I should have taken it out, if you will. I should have killed it. And so the goal with vaccines usually is to change the cells or to change the signature, if you will, of those of that group of tissue so that your immune system can say, hey, that's not normal. And so there's different ways to modulate um, cancer vaccines. And so that's what we tried to do to then say, hey, immune system, wake up. After that, we did a procedure called apheresis. So the dogs have now seen their cancer cells a second time, hopefully in a different manner, and their immune system is awake. And so we then collect their mononuclear cells. And specifically, we want T cells here. T cells are the uh, are the the um, are the money here? We really want those cells um, because those are going to be the the, the um, immune cells that will kill various things in your body that shouldn't be there. So after apheresis, we collect their cells and hopefully their T cells. Those were shipped to Elias, who would then um, grow and stimulate. Um, I used um, a curse word, I guess, but I would tell clients often they would piss off <laughs> the T cells uh, outside of the body, and then we give those back, and that's the activated portion of the T cell infusions. Um, after that, um, we then would do the cytokine boost to really give those cells that we gave um, uh, to the body um, a longer lifespan and also to excite other portions of the immune system. And then we followed them up. Um, so this is just a schematic here of the, of the vaccines. Again, we'd collect their tissues, make their vaccine outside of the body, and then actually do intradermal vaccines with the goal of hitting uh, antigen presenting cells. The apheresis, again, we collect mononuclear cells, expand those outside of the body, and then give back a, a killer T cell infusion. So the study here at Missouri, we had uh, 15 dogs uh, that we enrolled. Um, I kind of said before, the poster children, if you will, for uh, canine osteosarcoma are large breeds. We had labs, goldens, rottweilers, wolfhounds, um, giant breed dogs, uh, Great Danes, all of them, but, but mostly labs. And in the other studies we've done recently, those have also had mostly labs. So um, those, I think, are a definite predisposed breed. They were around seven years. I think that was in the, the table earlier. So we matched that in around 40 kilograms um, or about 90 pounds. Most of ours were distal radius, but also in the proximal humerus and then some in the hind limb as well. Uh, as in people, alkaline phosphatase or ALP um, levels in the serum, uh, if they're high, that's a negative prognostic factor. And so uh, we checked that as well. And we did have some dogs uh, with increased ALP that, that in theory would have a worse prognosis. So the big thing that we talk about is often outcome, but we also want to see if this was safe. And so toxicity, and you asked us earlier about fevers. Um, we did have some dogs that, that did develop fever or felt sick. Um, the asterisks here are actually a dog that we 
treated prior to pre-medicants, um, and those would be anti-nausea meds, um, anti-inflammatory meds, um, and so uh, antihistamines. And so we, we, the first dog we treated, we did not pre-medicate, um, and that dog got quite sick, um, made it through and lived a very long time, but that made us kind of stop reposition and um, we did a safety trial where we looked at healthy dogs and if we premedicated those and we actually found that with anti-nausea, antihistamines and anti-inflammatories, we could make them tolerate their infusions much, much better. And so all of the dogs afterwards received those and we only had mostly GI toxicity after that. So could they have developed a fever? Yes, um, we gave them an anti-inflammatory to prevent them from getting that fever in from from having nausea and vomiting. So um, then somebody might say, oh, you prevent the fever. Did you prevent the immune therapy from working? Uh, we'll get to that. I don't think we did. So there were some other toxicities, um, unrelated things with uh, amputations. Um, and then actually with uh, the apheresis procedure, we had a dog um, that developed AV block that resolved after the apheresis. And I think that was related to the calcium infusion um, during to prevent clotting. So the biggest thing with this was outcome. Um, the, what, I'll, what I'll say is that I don't want to compare these studies head to head because they're not randomized and um, um, time uh, related. So these are different studies that happen at different times, but these, these numbers are quite repeatable. So if you look um, on this Kaplan Meyer here on the right, I put lines on here to show <clears throat> where historical numbers were. And so if you look at dogs that just had amputation alone, historically they lived uh, just a few months. So three to four months is, is pretty standard across um, our literature. If you add chemotherapy, most dogs live in nine to 12 months, which is too short. Um, you know, and, and the big thing again is those pulmonary metastases that we're not, um, we're not clearing. Um, so those numbers are here. The, the COTC22 trial was standard of care. We'll talk about that here in a slide or two. And we found exactly that, that you know, around nine to 12 months, most of these dogs succumb to their disease. So the interesting thing with this um, ECI trial, the ELIAS trial, is that dogs lived, um, on, and again, this is a median, so it's not an average, it's just the middle of the road dog, and you can see here where that middle is, um, but 415 days. And the exciting part was that we have five dogs that are alive over 730 days, uh, or um, two years, and now we still have, I think, four, and we're over somewhere of, of 800 or 900 days. So um, we had a, a, a larger fraction than expected to survive long term, which was, was pretty exciting for us. And again, <clears throat> the novel part of this is no chemo. So that part has not been seen before. Um, any, any questions on that Elias um, trial or things before I move on to some other immune endeavors? Yes, I had two questions. Yeah. Um, because the trial is already happening in dogs, does that mean you can get it in humans and like skip the mouse trials? <laughs> Good question. So yeah, so um, I think that um, uh, human researchers, I just heard a dog, somebody's dog just, uh, just My dog. <laughs> um, so human researchers are starting to see the value of these companion dog trials um, because they have active <coughs> systems, they have much uh, more similar um, metabolism and physiologic processes as people. And so there are higher levels of evidence to move to trials. So there's actually quite a few researchers that have reached out to us or to the COTC to say, hey, we have this idea, could you do a dog trial that would help speed things along? So Charlotte, you're exactly right. That's the goal is use something that's so much more similar to people, hopefully help the dogs out too, and then say, hey, we could maybe skip a lot of those rodent trials that may um, not be good um, models for disease. Yeah. And then also do dogs have the same like long-term effects as humans? Yeah, so <clears throat> good question, and, and I will mention that in the next few slides, but the side effect profiles, whether it's chemo or immune therapy, we do worry about um, late side effects. So, for example, doxorubicin is used commonly in people, not just with necessarily osteo, but a lot of carcinomas. Um, and the big issue with doxorubicin is you can get a cumulative cardiomyopathy. Um, and so, um, especially, uh, let's say, breast cancer patients, uh, women with breast cancer, they'll have to watch, especially if they have predisposed heart conditions to giving doxorubicin. We do the same thing with dogs. We have a certain cutoff of how much doxorubicin we feel comfortable giving. And there's actually breeds that are predisposed to heart disease, and we get really nervous giving those dogs doxorubicin. So, yes, the answer, the short answer I could have given you is yes, um, but uh, they get the same 
potential long-term effects um, as people, whether it's heart, brain, kidneys, you name it. So, good questions. I have two questions too, and we don't necessarily yeah. have to talk about them, but since we're on this, are you gonna talk about this being fast-tracked for the glioblastoma later, or yes. can I ask that question now? Should I wait? We're gonna, we're gonna do it later, but that's a good segue. Okay, but, yeah, <laughs> So, but yeah. can I ask what um, my sister actually had a dog with osteo? So, if someone is asking about their dogs, I know we're talking about humans. Is there a way to get your dog into um, a trial? Are they all over or specific locations? Yes, um, good question. So, there is an AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, has a page that um, lists all the trials around the country. Um, the COTC organization, we currently don't have new osteosarcoma trials, but um, I think that some are in the works. Um, so yes, there, there are ways um, for them to, to have their dog enroll in a trial. They're primary veterinarians, um, kind of the same way that, that human medicine works is you have a general practitioner, um, they can refer you to an oncologist. And so um, their primary vet could say, hey, let me call somebody at an academic institution like Missouri and see what trials are available. But that AVMA website, I don't have it handy, but I can get that for everybody, um, uh, has a list of active trials. Thank you very much. Yeah, good question. All right, Anne, do you have any other ones for me? Yes, one more question. Uh, is the median survival time calculated based on time from diagnosis or from treatment? Diagnosis. Okay. And hopefully they get treated quite uh, soon after diagnosis. But um, yes, that is after after initial diagnosis. Cool. All right, we'll move on. Um, so the next uh, studies, I mentioned the numbers here, but we did COTC 21 and 22. Again, these are nationwide clinical trials. Um, this was actually looking at, um, it's a bit backwards, but 022 was standard of care, um, the SOC, and 021 was actually standard of care with rapamycin. Rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor that's actually used to prevent host versus graft disease. It's immunosuppressive. So you might say, wait, you were trying to activate the immune system. Well, sometimes you modulate the immune system. There's different uh, avenues where some of it should be activated, some should be um, quieted. There's a nice balance. So this was actually looked at for anti-proliferative effects, but also it may be immunomodulatory. Excuse me. Um, so these were head-to-head. -head. This was nationwide. There were supposed to be 80 dogs in each arm that were evaluated. Um, we actually needed to enroll over 300 nationwide, which seems kind of, kind of wild, but that shows you how many dogs um, can develop early metastasis. So um, we did 28 of those dogs at the University of Missouri. So we were pretty proud of doing about 10% of the nationwide enrollment. Um, we actually have, I have one that's still on study. That dog actually is, is um, still alive, um, but is off study now. Um, Amy presented these results um, at the Factor Conference and showed that, that there was no significant difference between rapamycin and standard of care. But this paper I would expect to be submitted and hopefully published later this fall, I think is a goal. So we should have that literature available to um, the, the general public, hopefully pretty soon. Um, so sadly, rapamycin did not seem to increase survival compared to standard of care alone, which was amputation and platinum chemotherapy. Um, and I just threw this in. There's actually a, a nice review about rapamycin. You might say, hey, it has anti-proliferative effects. Some people might say hey, it has immunosuppressive effects. I think the mTOR pathway actually is um, involved in a lot of other processes in cells. And so I like this title, One Drug, Many Effects. And so I don't think that it was as maybe specifically targeted as people were hoping. So um, the next endeavor um, that we're still um, following dogs on right now is the Listeria trial, and people have asked a lot about this. So um, there were two trials um, that were running. The um, COTC26 was, again, the Comparative Oncology Trials Consortium. That's just ac academic institutions around the country, and it's run by the National Cancer Institute. There were private practice um, uh, trials run by various um, places around the country that were looking at a different version of Listeria. That trial is closed and I, and I think is, has been published and it didn't have the best results, but I wouldn't compare that to this because it's a different type of Listeria, had different um, um, processing, different storage, and so I, I don't think it's, I don't think they're um, 
apples and apples, definitely apples and oranges. So anyway, for this COTC 26 trial, we're still following dogs. Um, we enrolled 11 dogs here at Mizzou. That was again about 10% of the nationwide enrollees. The goal here is that the Listeria actually has a HER2 construct. HER2 is um, well known in breast cancer in women. Um, it's actually an epidermal growth factor receptor um, that is overexpressed in breast cancer. Um, and so this isn't breast cancer, but there is um, some previous literature in humans and dogs and mice and rats that osteosarcoma may have HER2 expression. And so the goal is to say, oh, I give you listeria, your immune system sees listeria as foreign, recognizes HER2 as being foreign, and then you have then cross-reaction, if you will, with the cancer cells. Um, so this one has some interesting findings I can't share yet because we're still following dogs. And um, I think that we'll have some, some interesting um, outcome data, but also toxicity data. And so Charlotte, your question about long-term side effects, I think this one will shed some light on what could happen with immune therapy. And if you think about it, this is an activated listeria, but it's highly attenuated. So um, I think everybody maybe has heard of listeria, but I, that's one of your most common food poisonings. So we were giving dogs, um, we weren't poisoning dogs, but we were giving them a, a bacteria that is involved with natural infections in people. And so that's a risk for long-term um, infections, abscesses, and also then toxicities to different organs. So stay tuned for that. I think we'll have some really um, interesting findings from this study. The basis for this was done at the University of Pennsylvania. And I think um, Nikki Mason spoke at Factor um, back in the, um, a few years ago, maybe, and, um, but she had some initial work that showed, and again, these weren't head to head, these were historical controls. The tricky part here is everybody has standard of care and chemo and then HER2. And that's how this trial is set up. That's the nice thing about the Elias trial is there was no chemo um, to kind of muddy the waters. But anyway, she found that dogs had significantly longer survivals with the, with the HER2 vaccine. All right, I'll stop there and see if there's more questions. Sorry, that was a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of data with the COTC trials. Uh, we did have uh, Dr. Mason twice. And yeah really such exciting work with that listeria vaccine yeah. and it, it seems like it's about the same survival rate for the other trial yeah that that you're working on like 700 or so days yeah and i can't we can't do them head to head you know those weren't uh, her two versus the other one um but yeah both of those immune trials have shown some promise uh, better than chemo alone so in that in that time that that the life is extended of the of the canine patient what's that what's the quality of life like for that patient in that time yeah and so um i actually have some other work on looking at quality of life and really cancer pain um and but i'll so i'll tell you that the biggest uh inhibitor of quality of life is is um, perioperative so just like in people it's not like oh you have surgery and you're fine there's recovery period and and dogs I guess for humans, you know, you walk on two and you have two arms, right? Our dogs walk on all of their limbs. Um, and so we have to, to deal with lameness and reduced mobility and those things, no matter where we have the osteosarcoma. Um, but I will tell you, if dogs recover well from amputation, which most do, um, they do have a good quality of life until metastasis shows. So those dogs that stayed in remission did really, really well. I will say that there were some toxicities with the listeria that affected their quality of life. Um, but I, I just, um, I don't think it's fair for me to say exactly what those are when, you know, we just have a, a series of, of those dogs. Again, 11 out of um, um, uh, 80 evaluable, but 100 or so patients in the country. So um, I want to tell you guys, but I'll have to wait a little bit. <laughs> Most of their quality of lives are great. There are some unique side effects to this therapy. So Okay. So we'll have to just stay curious and stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> stay yeah. tuned. Um, so one quick question, what's the pre-med that you, that you give before the immunotherapy vaccine? Yeah, so in, in this study as well, we were allowed to use pre-meds, they're non-steroidals. Um, so we used um, uh, furacoxib, prevacox, not a human drug, those are canine non-steroidals, um, but usually COX-2 selective non-steroidals. So I would, I would compare that to, um, people have heard of Celebrex, um, so a celecoxib, which I think is off the market now, but um, ibuprofen is a non-selective, but similar to something like a ibuprofen or um, COX-2 instead. Yeah. Yep. Okay, last question for me. The rapamycin, 
that the the one canine patient that it worked in that pa- that dog is still alive yeah well so i had so I, I i guess i didn't specify so that one that's still in study actually got standard of care so um it uh, wasn't okay. the rapamycin arm so um i, I we had a couple of long-term survivals or yeah. survival survivors um and those were in both groups but we have one very very long dog I don't like to use the word cure because, you know, in people, they talk about five year survivals or different things. Our lifespans in our dogs, if they're getting this at seven, they're probably not going to live to 12 naturally anyway. So I hesitate to use the word cure because um, I don't want to jinx my patients, <laughs> but also, um, you know, it's hard to, to get them to live five years after. Um, I think the dog that's that's still alive is, is probably close to four years out. It's probably cured, um, but that was a standard of care dog. So sometimes standard of care works. Um, This study was negative, though, that the rapamycin did not um, increase dogs. Um, Maybe a few, but again, we had a few in the standard of care arm, too. Right. Well, that's the tricky thing about osteosarcoma, though, which is why I was interested in the rapamycin trial, because what works for me for the same grade, same everything osteosarcoma, I'm still here and the person in the bed next to me who got the same standard of care that I got is not. And, you know, you, everybody, I think at this point has seen that um, Ching Lao's chart on osteosarcoma patients where, okay, P53 obviously is a, is a driver, but there are so many drivers. It's just, it's just all over the map. No. So what works for one is not going to work for another. So I was interested in that outlier canine patient on, on the yeah. rapamycin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I wish it was this predictable, you know, um, but it's, we're getting better at it, but we still don't know exactly what will work and what should work. Um, and you're right, it is variable between patients with a very similar um, disease burden and, and disease presentation. All right, um, we'll talk about some other things. Um, so one of my focuses uh, has become uh, cancer pain. And so I think we talk a lot about metastasis and um, you know, cures. And I, I want to keep talking about those things, but I think we also have to talk about quality of life. And so Charlotte, you were asking about this um, and you mentioned it too. Um, the biggest thing for our dogs, especially if they're non-surgical and you might say, well, how would a dog be non-surgical? Um, so our standard of care, especially for proximal humerus is amputation. Um, because dogs have four legs and they have to use all of them, if dogs have severe, let's say, osteoarthritis or if they have another bone lesion, I can't just amputate multiple legs or say, oh, I'll take this weight-bearing limb off and now you have to walk on your really painful hips. So there are dogs that are non-surgical. And so that's really where I've struggled to say, what do I do for these patients to improve their quality of life? Um, And so our go-to now is actually zoledronate and radiation therapy. And I'm not saying this is first line at all. This is for dogs that aren't surgical. Um, so um, I, I, have, I have everybody's pictures over here, so let me move you guys really quick. Um, so uh, can you see the PET scan over here um, on, the, on the right side? So this is actually one of my um, favorite patients. Uh, she's a golden retriever. I think you can probably see her PET scan. Here's her proximal humerus osteo. Um, is my arrow showing up, Anne? Can you guys see that? Yeah, I see Casey and Charlotte say yes. So here's the osteosarcoma. What I think you'll also notice is that there is this bright spot over here. That's actually the shoulder joint. So the dog had severe um, uh, osteoarthritis in the um, uh, uh, contralateral shoulder. And then also if you check out back here, this tarsus. So I guess for you and I, that'd be like your ankle. Um, This dog had severe osteoarthritis in its tarsus too. So I was pretty nervous for this dog because it was painful in multiple locations, not just this kind of gross osteosarcoma. But if you say, let's remove this limb, we've got to think about how is the arthritic shoulder going to do? How is the arthritic um, tarsus going to do? I know this looks wild, but that's actually the hub where the pet uh, tracer was injected. There's some normal tissues here, heart, kidneys, urinary bladder, gallbladder, neck. But you guys, I think, can see the musculoskeletal portions here that light up that really shouldn't. So um, our group has been looking at combinations of which is a bisphosphonate um, and radiation therapy. And the, the thought here, there's actually a researcher that's at Guelph now, um, Dr. Poirier, has shown that uh, bisphosphonates actually could change the portion of the um, cell cycle that tumor cells are in. And if you can kind of freeze them or arrest them in those portions of the cell cycle, maybe radiation therapy would work better. 
And so you might say, okay, what does this have to do with the immune system? Well, I think there's also some immune um, effects at play with zoledronate because it inhibits um, osteoclasts, which chew up bone. But there are also plenty of other cells in your body like macrophages that chew up other things, maybe osteosarcoma. So different researchers have looked at zoledronate to see if actually could it be um, helping cancer or inhibiting cancer. And so we're specifically looking at cancer cells and do we kill more or cause more apoptosis um, with zoledronate and radiation therapy. And we have a couple of cell lines that we've got some neat data in. These are actually different primary metastatic lines and they have very different behaviors with zoledronate and radiation. I don't have time to go into all of those figures, but just to show you that their survival curves or their death curves look very different and they're both osteosarcoma. One's metastatic, one's a primary tumor. So um, I guess my point of this slide is that there are non-surgical cases and potentially people with metastases that we have to focus on also then quality of life and really easing pain and trying to prevent those cancers from progressing. And our focus right now is on figuring out um, are bisphosphonates the best part of that or are there other medications as well? So um, that goes into the next slide and I'm working with some folks at Stanford on finding new um, tracers to image these patients. And I'm pretty proud of this, uh, this image. Um, this is, these are the only dogs to ever be imaged with this tracer. And I'm not gonna tell you guys what it is because we're gonna be on a podcast and we're gonna be um, potentially on Spotify and YouTube. And I don't want somebody to scoop this because I gotta get it published before somebody else does it. Um, but these are dogs with osteosarcomas on the right. And these are normal dogs here on the left. And what I'll show you is the A is the tumor. So you guys can see here's an osteosarcoma of the distal radius. 3A and 3B, same dog. Um, osteosarcoma here is in the ulna, uh, which is a different presentation for us, but this is the same dog here and here. Um, I know the pictures, um, there's a lot going on, but if you notice the tumor in 3A to 3B, that dog actually had zoledronate and radiation therapy. Its lameness improved and its cancer also reduced with this tracer, which is kind of exciting. Same with this dog over here, primary tumor. Again, these were non-surgical. So this dog here had hip dysplasia. This dog, the owners were absolutely against amputation. Um, so this tumor on the ulna also decreased its expression of this tracer. Why I bring this up is that the interesting finding we found was that the draining lymph nodes in these dogs also lit up. And these are not metastatic lymph nodes. Osteosarcoma in dogs, as in people, doesn't really like to go to lymph nodes. We check them, but it more likely wants to go to soft tissues or different things. So these are not metastatic lymph nodes, but they're draining. And so I have some, some work to do on this, but I think there's some relationship between the immune system that's draining these tumors and the tumors themselves. And believe it or not, these dogs that had zoledronate radiation, their lymph nodes actually decreased in activity as well. And the lymph nodes received no therapy, kind of crazy. So um, here's the normal dogs to show you their lymph nodes should be quiet. That's C over here, sorry. Um, I think I'm running kind of um, low on time, so I'm gonna um, speed up here. Um, Casey, you asked me this, so um, here's, your, here's your slide. So um, I actually reached out to Elias, and I think um, Tammy Wayhouse, who's on the call as well, um, can, can chime in as well. But Elias is working on a larger osteosarcoma study, a multi-institutional, to look at a number of dogs to see if um, it does work, not just in the group that we treated, and the hope is that that study will then inform that technology for human osteosarcoma. So um, we're doing a, a bigger, so we did that initial pilot study here at Mizzou, we're doing a bigger study nationwide. And the goal is to then say, yes, let's move that towards human osteo if it does show an efficacy signal. And this is gonna be comparing to that standard of care we talked about before. Um, TVAX is kind of the sister corporation of Elias and they are a human um, uh, corporation. Um, they did receive FDA fast track designation for glioblastoma. Um, they're currently looking for investors to raise money. I know it's not osteosarcoma, I'm sorry, but it's another uh, terrible cancer. Um, and they're looking at starting that uh, human clinical trial. And again, the FDA did fast track that uh, for that specific tumor. Advaxis is the company that holds the rights to that Listeria HER2 vaccine. And they have licensed the vaccine to OS therapies for evaluation of human osteo. Um, I, I don't know the exact timeline and, and Amy LeBlanc at the NIH said she wasn't sure on exactly either. Um, so I don't know what to tell you about where that is in line for human trials. They might be waiting for us to give our final data sets from the canine trials, but I do know that they're moving towards human uh, trials for that HER2 construct as well. So um, I, I, I think it's kind of crazy that all this stuff we're doing really could affect 
um, kids with osteosarcoma. And so hopefully uh, we're doing some meaningful things for y'all. Um, the last thing I'll say is that that tracer I put down here um, is moving towards uh, being imaged in people with osteosarcoma at Stanford, which is awesome for me that I did dogs first and now they're gonna do some human osteo patients. So I believe that Stanford will probably put out a, a call for trial enrollees um, on the West Coast to get PET scans. Um, I know that they're dealing with COVID and closures of things, but um, I think all the things I showed are, are have translational correlates, which is pretty awesome. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I got a bunch of people to acknowledge my orthopedic groups here, um, our oncology group, um, Elias Animal Health, Noe, Gary, Tammy, um, my folks at Stanford, um, and Fred Chin's lab, and then Amy LeBlanc and Christina Masco at the NCIC OTC. And then one of my favorite patients, um, Titan here in the middle, um, is one of our dogs from that Elias trial that taught us a, a ton. And that, that guy, you guys asked about quality of life. He had a killer life. This is actually him on a canoe, so um, <laughs> three-legged. So I'll, I'll stop. I've been talking probably way too much and, and, and see if y'all have questions for me. Um, back to the quality of life. If pain is alleviated in your canine patients, do they live longer? Yeah, so that's the goal there is that um, we need to inhibit their tumors from progressing, but also if, if your pain's uncontrolled, um, the difference between our veterinary medicine patients and human patients is euthanasia. So we are allowed to euthanize patients that have a poor quality of life, um, not really a thing for human medicine. And so, yes, if I can control their pain, those dogs are gonna live longer and hopefully the owners will say, um, you know, let's, let's um, keep them um, feeling good and, and happy for longer. So, but that's the difference between the, the, the um, specialties there is that euthanasia is an option for patients that are in stage um, and have un, uh, untractable pain. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but yes, they should live longer. Good question. What was it about the glio? Why was FDA, why was it fast-tracked for that and not osteo? I feel like I'm missing something somewhere. Yeah, I didn't tell you this, but actually some of their previous studies that they did part of that ECI um, approach were in refractory gliomas. And so there is a small efficacy signal in that group of patients. And so that with our dog data, let them fast-track kind of the newer approach uh, for, for human trials. So there's already a so that's the thing I didn't tell you is that there was preliminary data in similar um, immune approaches uh, in glioma patients that we actually use for the dogs. And so that's, that's part of why it's been fast-tracked for that disease. Um, also, um, there's not great, which, I, you know, just like osteo when it's metastatic, there's not great options for that tumor if it's um, not easily resectable and low grade. So, but yeah, Thank preliminary you. data, good question. Okay. Thank you, that helps. Yeah. This is a little video, which uh, is, a, is a cat. Uh, it's just pretty cute. So um, I try to be serious, but I have a lot of fun at work too. And so I don't know if this is gonna show up. This is one of my, uh, is this just a cat, not a patient, but it's um, helping <laughs> with apheresis. So um, that's just to show you guys, we try to have fun. And also who doesn't love a cat video? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I talked only about dogs, so I had to put a cat in there too. So. <laughs> and cows. Yeah, exactly. Uh, since you're showing a cat video, I'll ask you a trivia question. Okay. Um, and, you know, you can take this back to the farm. And yeah. I bet you'll be the only one to be able to answer this. <laughs> Where was the John Deere tractor invented? Yeah, so Moline, Illinois. Um, I believe it's Moline, Illinois. Um, no? My aunt actually works for John Deere. She just retired. She worked for uh, John Deere in Moline in Rock Island, Illinois, so. Vermont. Is it really Vermont? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I think the first John Deere factory was in Moline, Illinois. I think so, too. I yeah, think so, yeah. too. I think he, you know, I think John Deere maybe was like, listen, guys, it's cold out here. Like, it's less cold in Illinois. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Let's go to Illinois. Take a show on the road. Yeah, yeah. We have a, in Rutland, Vermont, there's a, a monument that's funny. Yeah, to John. To John I like Deere. it. I like it. Oh, man. I'll, I'll, see your, I'll see your cat video and raise you a trivia. <laughs> Good. I like it. I like it. Um, I interrupt this osteobite session to acknowledge that Dr. Flesner was correct. John Deere was born in Rutland, Vermont, and founded John Deere in Moline, Illinois. Note to self, 
Do not challenge a farmer on a farm equipment trivia question. So many questions, so exciting. And I, it's, it's so needed and I'm, I'm so grateful for the, the symbiotic relationship that, that uh, doctors like you who are studying canine osteosarcoma patients and like um, so many like you, like uh, Dr. Mason, Nicola Mason, and uh, this relationship is so important because I think it, it will accelerate discovery for, for, for us, you know, for osteosarcoma kids and, and, um, and patients <laughs> like Charlotte and I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that, that really, we need discovery. And, you know, you mentioned earlier about the, the dinosaur, that's a 77 million year old osteosarcoma case. Yeah. And I like to tell people that if I got osteosarcoma, when people typically get it, like when they're 13, I was, mm -hmm. I was 13 in 1980. And I was treated the same in 2010 that I would be treated today that I would have been treated in 1980 yeah. which, like as a 13 year old. So I know we, we haven't made, we, for a while we were not making advances. And so um, I'm hoping, yeah. I'm hoping immune therapy really does um, change the paradigm and, and, and give us new insight and give us new ways to, to fight osteo. So. For sure, it needs to happen, but I believe it, it is happening. Yep. It is happening. There's so much innovation around osteosarcoma now and, and there's research money for it. And, and there's a dedicated osteosarcoma community who have given their limbs, their tumor data, their blood samples, everything to, to, to try to get us there. So I think with everybody on the same page, we'll get there. Okay, so our time is running out. Yeah, sorry, I spoke way too much. No, <laughs> not at all. It's such a great session. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, guys. Uh, all right, so it is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, which is also known as September, and we have another great session next week. Our guests will be CCTDI, or uh, Children's Cancer Therapy Development Institute. Um, their team will be with us, Dr. Charles Keller and Andy Woods. He'll be t they will be talking about legacy autopsy gifts. This is the afterlife gift of tissue, which I just talked about being so important for research. Um, this uh, legacy autopsy is uh, funded by the Childhood Cancer Project for osteosarcoma patients. And interestingly, it's the kids who are driving the afterlife autopsy so that no other child should have to suffer as they, as they do. It's, it's really an extraordinary thing. Um, finally, this might be, maybe not, but might be the last time you hear me talk about outrunning osteosarcoma. If you sign up and Pinky promise that you will virtually walk, run, or crawl, you will get a super soft vintage MIB t-shirt, which is everybody's favorite t-shirt. We'll I have one. They are great. I'll, I'll make a plug. They are really great. A shirt, right? Yeah, yeah. Truly. And um, we'll also send you a cape, uh, a Love Your Melon mask, and our giant uh, thanks. Most of all, you will get to make it better for kids with osteosarcoma. You can sign up on our website, mibagents.org, and just click uh, what we do, or you can also email us. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Uh, Flesner. And of course, thanks to our panelists, uh, OsteoWare Charlotte Murdoff, uh, Casey Crossan, our valuable team member at MIB. Um, together, we make it better for osteosarcoma kids everywhere wear your mask, and thank you for being here. Thank you for making it better. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and thanks for making it better for kids with osteosarcoma.